This program was sponsored by the Jesse and John Dance Fund. Since 1962, these lectures have been a forum for distinguished scholars of national and international reputation who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. Good evening. My name is Marcia Landolt. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School. And on behalf of the Graduate School of the University of Washington, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. We're here this evening because of a very generous gift that was made to the University of Washington over 30 years ago. In 1961, the estate of Mr. John Dance uh, made a gift to the University of Washington to create this lectureship and visiting professorship program. An additional gift was added in 1961 by Mrs. John Dance. The purpose of the gift, as stated by the benefactors, was to bring to the University of Washington and to the citizens of this region distinguished lecturers, scholars, and authorities of international reputation who and I quote, have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. I think you will agree with me that this was a very generous and far-sighted gift to this community. Before proceeding with this program, I would like to acknowledge a few people who have helped to make this evening possible. First of all, I would like to acknowledge Janet Jones, who's sitting here at the front of the auditorium. Janet is a member of the staff of the Graduate School, and her job is to do all of the logistics and organization for both the John, uh, Jesse and John Dance and the Walker Ames professorships. This is a complicated job that involves a lot of uh, airline reservations and telephone calls and faxes and everything you can imagine, and Janet always does it very professionally and graciously, and we appreciate the work that she does. Secondly, every year we put out a call for nominations for both the Walker Ames and the Jesse and John Dance Lectures. And every year we get a wealth of absolutely outstanding nominations, many more than we can possibly uh, accommodate. And it falls to the selection committee to make those hard choices and decide which uh, people we will extend invitations to. The selection committees are large and include a number of faculty and staff of the university, but I would particularly like to acknowledge the co-chairs of that committee, uh, Professor Michael Halloran, who's here with us this evening, and Professor Gerald Baldesty. Um, this evening, we're going to begin with a dramatic reading and then I will rejoin you a little bit later to introduce a couple of other people to you. Thank you for being here. Through the storm 
demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacle of segregation and the chains of discrimination. I was there when King gave his speech. The March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom happened the summer after my first year in college. And it marked the beginning of my radicalization. The march was a great way to begin my career as an activist. But it would be many years before I could again appreciate King as much as I did then, as an incredibly naive, college student watching him up there on the stage at the Lincoln Memorial. After that day, my memories of the march were hard to separate from what I heard about it, or my memories of later media coverage. I saw history being made at the march, but couldn't understand its historical significance until much later. It happens that way sometimes. We pass through history and look for traces of our passage in the historical records of other people's experiences. Passages and documents give new meaning to our experiences. I saw King at the march, but I didn't know then that he was giving his historic I have a dream speech, a speech that would be repeated countless times at King Day celebrations. I saw King from a distance when he lived, but I'm much closer to Martin now that I study him through his papers and through the memories of those who knew him best. It had been my wish to march with him because I wanted the joy of being with him on that special day. However, it had been decided by the planning council that the march would be led by the top leadership and, of course, I acceded to their wishes. I must confess, though, I felt that the involvement in the movement of some of the wives had been so extensive that they should have been granted the privilege of marching with their husbands. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality to all of God's children. Yeah. 
the way it worked out, the leaders did not really lead the march on Washington because by the time they got lined up, all those tens and thousands of people who had been waiting for hours had assembled themselves and moved in a great procession to the Lincoln Memorial. The leaders fell into the line of march with the people. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecutions and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. The march is just a middle class picnic. Why don't you join the real movement in Albany and Mississippi? I didn't want to admit to Stokely Carmichael that, I, that just coming to the march was the most radical thing I'd ever done in my life. <laughs> I wasn't quite ready to drop out of college to join the movement. But Stokely and the other young militants of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC as it was known, made me aware that King's Oratory was only one facet of a freedom struggle that had many extraordinary leaders. I say to you today, my friends, that even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. While King was having a dream, the rest of us Negroes were having a nightmare. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. The president and the administration in Washington should get Academy Awards for directing the best show of the century. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. White leaders should get Academy Awards because they acted like they really loved Negroes and fooled a whole lot of them. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. And the Negro leaders also deserve the awards for the best supporting cast. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill in Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Catholics and Protestants, we're able to join hands and sing in the words of that old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. I had never heard about Malcolm X when I attended the march, but his speeches altered my understanding of it and of King. Malcolm wasn't really part of the civil rights struggle then because he supported the Nation of Islam's policy of race, racial separation. But he recognized that the Southern freedom struggle was a challenge to Elijah Muhammad's policy against political engagement. At first, I resented Malcolm for putting down those of us who were standing up to segregationist officials rather than simply talking about confronting the white man. But then I came to see that both Malcolm and Martin were each trying to define the historical significance of what we were doing. They expressed competing truths that reflected the different ways black people have experienced America, as a dream or as a nightmare. My father, Earl Little, was a Baptist minister. He never pastored any regular church of his own. He was always a visiting preacher. My father, a Baptist minister. My grandfather was a preacher. My great-grandfather was a preacher. My memories are the friction between my father and mother. An educated woman, I suppose, can't resist the temptation to co correct an uneducated man. 
We raised much of our own food. I knew that the collection my father got for his preachings were mainly what fed and clothed us, and he also did other odd jobs. But still, the image of him that made me proudest was crusading and militant campaigning the words of Marcus Garvey. As young as I was then, I knew from what I overheard that my father was saying something that made him a tough man. I remember an old lady grinning and saying to my father, you're scaring these white folks to death. My mother, as the daughter of a successful minister, had grown up in comparative comfort. She had been protected from the worst blights of discrimination. But my father, a sharecropper's son, had met its brutalities at first hand and had begun to strike back at an early age. He never hesitates to tell the truth and speak his mind, however cutting it is. This quality of frankness often caused people to actually fear him. I have had young and old alike say to me, I'm scared to death of your dad. Daddy King was a big man, physically and spiritually. He stood strong and broad in his pulpit, afraid of no man, black or white, telling it like it is, preaching the word to his congregation and giving them his overflowing love. I have rarely ever met a person more fierce and courageous than my father. He had been president of the local NAACP and always stood out in social reform. He led the fight in Atlanta to equalize teachers' salaries and had been instrumental in the elimination of Jim Crow elevators in the courthouse. As pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, he wielded great influence in the Negro community and perhaps won the grudging respect of whites. At any rate, they never attacked him physically, a fact that filled my brother and sister and me with wonder as we grew up in this tension-packed atmosphere. Among the reasons my father had decided to risk and dedicate his life to help disseminate Garvey's philosophy, philosophy among his people was that he had seen four of his six brothers die by violence, three of them killed by white men, including one by lynching. It was one morning when we children at home got the word that he was dead. I was six. I can remember a vague commotion in the house had filled up with people crying, saying bitterly that the white black legion had finally gotten him. So there we were. My mother was 34 years old now, with no husband, no provider or protector to take care of eight children. I have never experienced the feeling of not having the basic necessities of life. This is not to say that I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Far from it. My father always had sense enough not to live beyond his means. So for this reason, the first 25 years of my life were very comfortable years. If I had a problem, I could always call daddy. Things were solved. Life had been wrapped up for me in a Christmas package. One day something happened which was to become the first major turning point of my life. Somehow I happened to be along in the classroom with Mr. Ostrowski, my eighth grade English teacher. I was one of his top students, one of the school's top students, but all he could see for me was the kind of future in your place that almost all white people see for black people. He told me, Malcolm, you ought to be thinking about a career. Have you been giving it thought? Truth is, I hadn't. I never figured out why I told him. Well, yes, sir, I've been thinking I'd like to be a lawyer. Mr. Ostrowski looked surprised, I remember it, and leaned back in his chair and clasped his hands behind his head. He kind of half smiled and said, Malcolm, one of life's first needs is for us to be realistic. And don't misunderstand me now. We all like you here. You know that. But you've got to be realistic about being a nigger. A lawyer, that's no realistic goal for a nigger. And it was then that I began to change inside. I drew away from white people. I wrote to my half-sister Ella in Boston, not saying why. I told Ella I wanted to come there and live. 
All praise is due to our law that I went to Boston when I did. If I hadn't, I'd probably still be a brainwashed black Christian. From about the age of three, I had had a white playmate who was about my age. I remember how our friendship began to break as soon as we entered school. Of course, this was not my desire, but his. The climax came when he told me one day that his father had demanded that he would play with me no more. I immediately asked my parents about the motive behind such a statement. Here, for the first time, I was made aware of the existence of a race problem. As my parents discussed some of the tragedies that had resulted from this problem, and some of the insults they themselves had confronted on account of it, I was greatly shocked. And from that moment on, I was determined to hate every white person. As I grew older, this feeling continued to grow. My parents would always tell me that I should not hate the white man, but that it was my duty as a Christian to love him. The question arose in my mind, how could I love a race of people who hated me and had been responsible for breaking up with one of my best childhood friends? This was a great question in my mind for a number of years. I did not conquer this anti-white feeling until I entered college and came in contact with white students through working in an interracial organizations. The white southerner, you can say one thing, he is honest. He bears his teeth to the black man. He tells the black man to his face that Southern whites will never accept phony integration. The advantage of this is the Southern black man never has been under illusions about the opposition he is dealing with. But the Northern white man, he grins with his teeth and his mouth has always been full of tricks and lies of equality and integration. I am a creation of Northern white man and his hypocritical attitude toward the Negro. I believe that it would be almost impossible to find anywhere in America a black man who has lived further down in the mud of human society than I have, or a man who has been any more ignorant than I have, or a black man who has suffered more anguish during his life than I have. Martin wanted to learn firsthand what life was really like for underprivileged people, to learn their problems and feel their feelings. Instead of taking a job in one of the white collar businesses, he chose to do hard manual labor. He worked handling baggage for the Railway Express Agency, and he took another job on the loading platform of the Southern Red String Mattress Company. In these jobs, he found out what it was like to work under white, bo under white bosses. The foreman of the Railway Express Agency often addressed the black worker as a nigger. And at the mattress company, Martin himself suffered almost daily humiliation. I was deeply concerned from my early teen days about the gulf between superfluous wealth and abject poverty. And my reading of Marx made me ever more conscious of this gulf. Although modern American capitalism has greatly reduced the gap through social reforms, there is still need for better distribution of wealth. We're still dealing with class issues. We're dealing with the problem of the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. Even before the two men ever met in person, Malcolm and Martin were engaged in a dialogue with one another that would become part of the enduring legacy of our freedom struggle. The masses of black people in this country are the offshoot of the ne field Negro during slavery. They are the ones who are jobless. They are the last hired and the first fired. They are the ones who are forced to live in the ghetto and the slum. They are the ones who are not allowed to integrate. They are not the hand-picked Negroes who benefit from token integration. They are not the bourgeois who get the crumbs that fall from the white man's table. Elijah Muhammad's Muslim movement is nourished by the contemporary frustration over the continued existence of racial discrimination. It is made up of people who have lost faith in America, who have absolutely repudiated Christianity, and who have concluded that the white man is an incurable devil. I think any black man who goes among so-called Negroes today are being brutalized, spit upon, in the worst fashionable and imaginable, and teaches those Negroes to turn the other cheek, to suffer peacefully, or love their enemy as a traitor to the Negro. 
Everybody on earth has a right to defend himself. Some of the black nationalists transferred their bitterness toward the white man, toward me, saying these things about my being soft, my talking about love, about my being sort of a polished Uncle Tom. In fact, Malcolm X had a meeting once, and he talked about me and said, you ought to go over there and let old King know what you think about him. If people get the impression that Negroes all endorse this old turn-of-the-cheek cowardly philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King, then whites are going to make the mistake of putting their hands on some black man, thinking that he's going to turn the other cheek, and he'll end up losing his hand. They didn't see that there's a great deal of difference between non-resistance to evil and non-violent resistance. Malcolm was clearly a product of the hate and violence invested in the Negro's blighted existence in this nation. He, like so many of our number, was a victim of the despair inevitably deriving from the conditions of oppression, poverty, and injustice which engulfed the masses of our race. In his youth, there was no hope no preaching, teaching, or movements of nonviolence. I met Malcolm X once in Washington, but circumstances did not enable me to talk with him for more than a minute. Well, Malcolm, good to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you. Now you're going to get investigated. He was an eloquent spokesman for his point of view, and no one could honestly doubt that Malcolm had a great concern for the problems that we face as a race. I'll tell you one of the dangers of Martin Luther King. King himself is probably a good man, means well and all that, but the danger is that white people use King. They use him to satisfy their own fears. They give him power beyond his actual influence. But the danger is when they fool themselves into thinking that Negroes are really nonviolent, and patient and long-suffering. They've got a powder keg in their house, and instead of them trying to do something to defuse the powder keg, they're putting a blanket over it, trying to make believe that this is no powder keg. King confuses nonviolence a tactic and makes it a principle. And because he is a principled man, he has to be uncompromising in his principles, therefore, he cannot compromise nonviolence. White folks nailed him to the cross when they gave him the Nobel Peace Prize. I accept the Nobel Prize for Peace at a moment when 22 million Negroes of the United States of America <coughs> are engaged in creative battle to end the long night of racial injustice. I believe that even amidst mortar burst and whining bullets, there is still hope for a brighter tomorrow. King's got the prize, we got the problem. I don't want the white man giving me medals. If I'm following a general and he's leading me into battle and the enemy tends to give him awards, I get suspicious of him. Especially if he gets a peace medal before the war is over. Mm. Martin might have been a great orator, but it seems as if Malcolm often had the best lines. Martin's nonviolent strategy achieved civil rights victories but Malcolm gave black people the psychological rewards of rhetorical vengeance. I often wish that he could talk less of violence because violence is not going to solve our problem. In his litany of articulating the despair of the Negro without offering any positive creative alternative, I feel that Malcolm has done himself and our people a great disservice fiery demagogic oratory in the black ghettos, urging Negroes to arm themselves and to prepare to engage in violence, as he has done, could reap nothing but grief. As the Southern black struggle became increasingly intense during 1963 and 64, Malcolm became more and more dissatisfied with the apolitical stance of his mentor, Elijah Muhammad. He began to hear black people say, those Muslims talk tough, but they never do anything unless somebody bothers Muslims. Wherever black people committed themselves in the, the Little Rocks and the Birminghams and other places, militant disciplined Muslims should also be there for all the world to see and respect and discuss. In March 1964, Malcolm declared his independence from the Nation of Islam. 
and increased his efforts to forge ties with militant elements in the civil rights movement. The present racial crisis in this country carries within it powerful destructive ingredients that may soon erupt into an uncontrollable explosion. The seriousness of this situation demands that immediate steps must be taken to solve this crucial problem before the racial powder keg explodes. A racial explosion is more destructive than a nuclear explosion. A united front involving all Negro fascist elements and their leaders is absolutely necessary. Now, I am not out to fight other Negro leaders or organizations. I have forgotten everything bad that the other leaders have said about me. And I pray that they can also forget the many bad things that I've said about them. As leaders, we must stop worrying about the threat that we seem to pose to each other's personal prestige and concentrate our united efforts towards solving the unending hurt that is being done daily to our people here in America. If capitalistic Kennedy and communistic Khrushchev can find something in common on which to form a united front despite their tremendous ideological differences, it is a disgrace for Negro leaders, leaders not to be able to submerge our minor differences in order to seek a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. But Malcolm did not find it easy to heal the wounds of the past. He came down to Selma and said some pretty passionate things against me. And that surprised me, because after all, it was my own territory down there. I thought I would pass through Selma and get a good closer look at the condition of our people in this country. Around the 1st of February, Martin and Ralph Abernathy led a march to the Selma Courthouse to protest the difficulty of registering Negro voters. They were all arrested. During the five days they were in prison, I went to Selma to see them and to participate in the struggle. The day we arrived at Brown's Chapel for a noonday mass meeting, Andy Young came up to me and said, you're going to have to come inside and greet the people because Malcolm X is here and he's really roused them. I gave a short inspirational speech emphasizing the non-violent approach. After I spoke, I was introduced to Malcolm for the first time. I was impressed by his obvious intelligence, and he seemed quite gentle. Mrs. King, will you tell Dr. King I had planned to visit with him in jail? I won't get a chance now because I've got to leave to get back to New York. I want Dr. King to know that I didn't come to Selma to make his job difficult. I really did come thinking that I could make it easier. If the white people realize what the alternative is, perhaps they will be more willing to hear Dr. King. He thought he could help me more by attacking me than praising me. He thought it would be easier for me in the long run. I am 100% for any effort put forth by black people in this country to have access to the ballot. And I frankly believe that since the ballot is our right, that we are within our right to use whatever means is necessary to secure these rights. And I think that people in this part of the world would do well to listen to Dr. Martin Luther King and give him what he's asking for and give it to him fast before some other factions come along and try to do it another way. Martin firmly agreed with certain aspects of the program that Malcolm X advocated. For example, he shared with Malcolm the fierce desire that the African American reclaim his racial pride his joy himself and his race in a physical, a cultural, and a spiritual rebirth. He shared with the naturalists the sure knowledge that black is beautiful and that in so many respects, the quality of the black people's scale of values was far superior to that of the white culture which attempted to enslave us. Martin too had a close attachment to our African brothers and to our common heritage. 
and Martin too believed that white Christianity had failed to act in accordance with these teachings. However, my husband felt that it was not the Christian ethic that must be rejected, but those who failed Christianity must be brought through love to brotherhood for their own redemption as well as ours. Sometimes I have dared to dream to myself that one day history may even say that my voice which disturbed the white man's smugness and his arrogance and his complacency, that my voice helped to save America from a grave, possibly even a fatal catastrophe. The goal has always been the same, with the approaches to it as different as mine and Dr. King's nonviolent marching, that dramatizes the brutality and the evil of the white man against defenseless blacks. And in the racial climate of this country today, it is anybody's guess which of the extremes in approach to the black man's problem might personally meet a fatal catastrophe first. Nonviolent Dr. King, or so-called violent me. It was tragic that when Mark Malcolm was killed, he was really coming around, moving away from racism. This great tragedy occurred at a time when Malcolm X was reevaluating his own philosophical presuppositions and moving toward a greater understanding of the nonviolent movement and toward more tolerance of white people generally. There were also indications of an interest in politics as a way of dealing with problems of the Negro. But he was not yet able to renounce violence and overcome the bitterness which life had invested in him. All of these were signs of a man of passion and zeal, seeking for a program through which he could channel his talents. But history would not have it so. A man who lived under the torment of knowledge of the rape of his grandmother and murder of his father, and under the conditions of the present social order, does not readily accept that social order to seek to integrate into it. The death of Malcolm X affected me profoundly. Perhaps it was because I had just met him, and perhaps it was because I began to understand him better. Martin and I had began to reassess our feelings toward him. We realized that since he had been to Mecca and had broken with Elijah Muhammad, he was moving away from hatred toward internationalism and against exploitation. I know that Though he never said so publicly, Malcolm X had deep respect for Martin. He recognized that Martin was unique, not alone in talent or eloquence, but in fearlessness and courage. Malcolm admired manhood, and he knew how supremely Martin exemplified it. I always had a deep affection for Malcolm and felt that he had a great ability to put his finger on the existence and the root of the problem. When Malcolm was assassinated, I was in Los Angeles working with the Nonviolent Action Committee of South Central LA. Within a few months of his death, his ideas suddenly gained a popularity far beyond anything he had experienced in his lifetime. In August 1965, the uprising in South Central demonstrated that many urban blacks were following Malcolm's lead. Martin came to Watts to try to convince skeptical residents of the validity of his nonviolent philosophy. Martin told us after his trip to Watts that as he walked the streets those terrible nights, the people, young and old, would gather and listen to him thoughtfully and sympathetically. Of course, the problem was that it was physically impossible to get to see most of the people, and that once a riot starts, the, violent mo the violence multiplies upon itself, and tragedy is almost inevitable. For the rest of his life, Martin was on the defensive. And at the time, my sympathies were with the angry children of Malcolm X. I would only later understand Martin's courage and commitment during this difficult period, when he was caught in the middle between those who criticized him for his anti-war stands and his poor people's campaign and those who saw him as insufficiently militant. In recent months, several people have said to me, since violence is the new cry, 
Isn't there a danger that you will lose touch with the people in the ghetto and be out of step with the times if you don't change your views on nonviolence? My answer is always the same. While I'm convinced that the vast majority of Negroes reject violence, even if they did not, I would not be interested in being a consensus leader. I refuse to determine what is right by taking a Gallup poll of the trends of the time. In May 1966, Stokely Carmichael became chair of SNCC and soon succeeded Malcolm as Martin's main public adversary. During the Mississippi March, held in response to the shooting of James Meredith, Stokely confronted Martin with a new slogan, Black Power. We had been marching for about 10 days when we passed through Grenada. Stokely did not conceal his growing eagerness to reach Greenwood. This was SNCC territory, in the sense that the organization had worked courageously there during the turbulent summer of 1964. As we approached the city, large crowds of old friends and new turned out to welcome us. At a huge mass meeting that night, Stokely mounted the platform. The only way we're going to stop them white men from whooping us is to take over. Every courthouse in Mississippi ought to be burned down to get rid of the dirt. We've been saying freedom for six years, and we ain't got nothing. What we're going to start saying now is black power. Ain't nothing wrong with anything black, because I'm all black, and I'm all good. And from now on, when they ask you what you want, you know what to tell them? We want black power. Black power. We want black power. Black power. We want black power. Black power. Sensing a widening split in our ranks, I asked Stokely to join me in a frank discussion of the problem. For five long hours, I pleaded with the group to abandon the black power slogan. I mentioned the implication of violence that the press had already attached to the phrase. Power is the only thing respected in this world. We must at any cost, we must get it at any cost. Martin, you know as well as I do that practically every other ethnic group in America has done just this. The Jews, the Irish, and the Italians did it. Why can't we? That is just the point. No one has ever heard the Jews publicly chant a slogan of Jewish power, but they have power. We must use every constructive means to amass economic and political power. This is the kind of legitimate power we need. But this must come through a program, not merely a slogan. How can you arouse the people to unite around a program without a slogan or a rallying cry? Didn't the labor movement have slogans? Haven't we had slogans all along in the freedom movement? What we need is a slogan with black in it. Why not use the slogan black consciousness or black equality? These phrases would be less vulnerable and would uh, be more accurate describing what we are about. The words black and power together give the impression that we are talking about black domination rather than equality. Martin, I deliberately decided to raise the issue on the march in order to give it a national form and force you to take a stand for black power. I have been used before. One more time won't hurt. Many of the young people proclaiming black power today were but yesterday the devotees of black, white corporations and nonviolent direct action. If Stokely Carmichael now says that nonviolence is irrelevant, it is because he, as a dedicated veteran of many battles, has seen with his own eyes the most brutal white violence against Negroes and white civil rights workers, and he has seen it go unpunished. Black power is a psychological call to manhood with a spirit straining toward true self-esteem. The Negro must say to himself and the world, I am somebody. I have a rich and noble history. This is positive and necessary. Power for black people. I had a great deal of respect for King, a great deal of respect. Because I had seen King, I had seen him on the front lines. Martin taught us to confront the enemy without fear. I have seen his courage. I had seen him when in mass meetings in the South when the police just came in ruthlessly and everybody was shaking and shivering with fear. 
So I have a great deal of respect for him. He's not an opportunist, no. But people loved Martin Luther King Jr. They loved him. I've seen people climb over each other just to say, I touched him. I touched him. I had to follow in his footsteps when I went there. The people didn't know what SNCC was. They just said, you one of Dr. King's men? Yes, ma'am, I am. Before I was a civil rights leader, I was a preacher of the gospel. This was my first calling, and it still remains my greatest commitment. I have no other ambitions in life but to achieve excellence in the Christian ministry. I don't plan to run for political office, and what I'm doing in this struggle along with many others grows out of my feeling that the preacher must be concerned about the whole man, not merely his soul, but his body. It's all right to talk about the streets flowing with milk and honey in heaven, but I want some food to eat down here. And any religion that professes to be concerned about the souls of men and is not concerned about the slums that cripple the soul the economic conditions that stagnate the soul, and the city governments that may damn the soul is a dry, dead, do-nothing religion in need of some blood. The last time I saw him was in 1966. I noticed that he spoke with far less energy than he had at the March on Washington three years earlier. He looked tired and spoke more slowly and deliberately than I remember from seeing him earlier. It was as if his words carried the weight of unfulfilled dreams. Some years ago in Washington, on a sweltering afternoon in August, I strive to tell the nation of a dream I had. And I must honestly say to you that since that afternoon, I have constantly watched my dream turn into a nightmare. I saw my dream shattered. Yes, I saw my dream shattered when the riots developed in Wallace. But I still have a dream. I still have a dream that in spite of the madness of militarism and the escalation of war, Nations will not rise up against nations and will study war no more. I still have a dream that one day the rat-infested slums of our nation will be plowed into the junk heaps of, of history and Negroes and whites will stand side by side in decent sanitary housing. I still have a dream that one day Right here in this land, justice will roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. By 1966, it had become apparent to Martin that not only was the Vietnam War wrong, but that it had, was engulfing huge sums of money that could otherwise be spent on fighting poverty. Martin planned to make his first speech devoting entirely to Vietnam on April 4th, 1967 at the Riverside Church in New York City. I had made a statement back in 1965 and I was criticized and I held back. But this time I vowed I would not compromise. He had come to the point where he had to speak and he was willing to accept the consequences. I know the voices that are being raised saying that it's hurting the civil rights movement to take a stand against the war in Vietnam. I agonized a great deal over this whole problem. I thought about civil rights, and I thought about the war in Vietnam. And something said to me, Martin, you've got to stand up on this. No matter what it means, there are times in life when you must take a position that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but you do it because it is right. That is where I am today. My mind is made up. 
I will not be intimidated. I will not be harassed. I will not be silent. I will be heard. When I took up the cross, I recognized its meaning. It is not something that you merely put your hands on. It is not something that you wear. A cross is something that you are willing to die for if necessary. It means that you must stand up for truth sometimes. The cross may mean the death of your popularity. It may mean the death of your bridge to the White House. But that is the meaning of the cross to take it up and bear it. Martin's address was one of the finest and most prophetic speeches he had ever made. The reaction of the press to his speech was predictable and controversial. What we had not expected to be quite so strong was the reaction among Martin's colleagues in the civil rights movement. Most of them felt that the civil rights cause would be hurt by his pronouncements. I replied to some of my friends, those persons who did not agree with my husband now do not understand the meaning of his whole life. You cannot believe in peace at home and not believe in international peace. You think of him as a politician, but he feels as a minister, he has a prophetic role and must speak out against the evil of society. What explained Martin's determination to stay the course when so many people doubted him? Did he begin to doubt himself? Passages in his speeches and sermons and writings reveal his inner doubts and explain the inner resources that enable him to overcome these doubts and hold on to his dream. The answers to the questions were always staring at me, but I didn't recognize them until I understood Martin's background, his roots in the African American Baptist Church. He didn't come to his faith readily, for there were periods of religious doubt during his formative years. But when Martin felt most besieged and alone, there was always a place where he could refresh his soul and return to the struggle with new energy and determination. I was always the questioning and precocious type. At the age of 14, I shocked my Sunday school class by denying the bodily resurrection of Jesus. At the age of 15, I entered college and more and more could see a gap between what I learned in Sunday school and what I was learning in college. I had grown up in the church and the church meant something very real to me. But it was a kind of inherited religion and I had never felt an experience with God in the way that you must have if you're going to walk the lonely paths of this life. But one day after finishing school, I was called to a little church down in Montgomery, Alabama, and I started preaching there. Things were going well in that church. It was a marvelous experience. But one day, a lady by the name of Rosa Parks decided that she wasn't going to take it any longer. It was the beginning of a movement where 50,000 black men and women refused absolutely to ride the city buses. After the white people in Montgomery knew that we meant business, they started doing some nasty things. They started making nasty telephone calls, threatening my life, the life of my family, the life of my children. I never will forget one night, very late. It was around midnight. The telephone started ringing, and I picked it up. On the other end, was an ugly voice. That voice said to me in substance, nigger, we are tired of you and your mess. And if you aren't out of town in three days, 
We're going to blow your brains out and blow up your house. And then I started thinking about many things. The theology and philosophy that I had just studied in the universities, trying to give philosophical and theological reasons for the existence and the reality of sin and evil. But the answer didn't quite come there. I thought about a beautiful little daughter who had just been born about a month earlier. And I got to the point that I couldn't take it any longer. I was weak. Something said to me, you can't call on daddy now. You can't even call on mama now. You've got to call on that something in that person that your daddy used to tell you about. That, that, that power that can make a way out of no way. And I discovered then that religion had to become real to me. And I had to know God for myself. Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. But Lord, I confess that I'm, I'm weak now. I'm faltering. I'm, I'm trying to do what's right. But Lord, I, I can't let the people see me like this. If they see me weak and losing my courage, they will become weak. And it seemed at that moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. And I'll tell you, I've seen the lightning flash. I've heard the thunder roll. I've felt sin breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus saying, still fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. If you have never found something so dear, so precious to you that you will die for it, then you aren't fit to live. And one day, some great opportunity stands before you and calls upon you to stand up for some great principle, some great issue, some great call and you refuse to do it because you want to live longer or you're afraid that somebody will stab you or shoot you or bomb your house. Well, you may go on and live until you are 90, but you died. When you refuse to stand up for right, you died. When you refuse to stand up for truth, you died when you refused to stand up for justice. Don't ever think that you're by yourself. Take a stand for what you think is right. And the world may misunderstand you and criticize you, but you never go alone.
If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody that is traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian art, if I can bring salvation If I can spread the message that the master taught, then my living shall not be in vain. On Thursday, April 4th, I took Yoki downtown and bought her some dresses. I had not been home very long when the telephone rang. It was Jesse Jackson. He said, Coretta, Doc just got shot. Not, it hit me hard. Not surprise, but shock. That the call I seemed subconsciously to be waiting for all our lives had come. Every now and then, I guess we all think realistically about the day when we will be victimized. And what is life's common denominator? That's something called death. And I think about my own funeral. I ask myself, what is it that I once said? I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness and all the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine, luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song. If I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian art, if I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can spread the message as the master taught then my living will not be in vain.
Well, I think all of you will join me in thanking this fine group of actors and musicians and writers for a really inspirational evening. Now, now it's my pleasure to introduce to you a distinguished member of the University of Washington faculty who has himself been a participant in the civil rights struggle that you've heard about tonight. Professor Michael Honey is Associate Professor of American History and Labor and African American Studies at the University of Washington, Tacoma. He also directs the Center for Study of Community and Society and the Ernie Tanner Labor and Ethnic Studies Center at the UW-Tacoma campus. Dr. Honey's 1993 study, Southern Labor and Black Civil Rights, Organizing Memphis Workers, won three National Book Awards for Race Relations, Labor, and Southern History. He has published numerous articles on that topic in scholarly journals and books. He is currently completing Black Workers Remember, an oral history that is being published by the University of California Press. And he is working on Martin Luther King's unfinished agenda, The Struggle for Economic Justi Justice with W.W. W. Norton. Dr. Honey worked for six years as a civil liberties and civil rights organizer in the South before entering academia, and he has organized numerous public programs of music and history of part of his continuing work for social change. And now it is his distinct honor to introduce to you our speaker, Professor Claiborne Carson. Claiborne Carson is professor of American history at Stanford University. He's been honored with numerous fellowships as well as distinguished lectureships at American University, University of California, Berkeley, and Emory University. He has a long and distinguished scholarly career, writing dozens of articles and publishing more than, a, <clears throat> more than half a dozen books. With the help of his partner Susan and students and staff at Stanford, he's currently editing Dr. Martin Luther King's papers, which are expected to run to 14 volumes being published by the University of California Press. Dr. Carson is both a scholar and a continuing active participant in African American political movements. His thought-provoking historical work concerns not only our collective past, but our hope for future. As a lecturer, author, editor, and advisor to filmmakers, he has been a faithful chronicler of, freedom, of the freedom struggle and has helped to shape our understanding of how social change comes about. He first opened our eyes to the power of group-centered leadership and grassroots organization through his 1981 study in Struggle, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Black Awakening of the 1960s, winner of the Frederick Jackson Turner Award of the Organization of American Historians. As he has done ever since, in that book, Dr. Carson examined the complexities of both individual and group struggles to, to create solidarity and movements for equal rights and justice within the context of a history that is denied both to most African Americans. He presents no simple answers as to how movements for change succeed or how individuals can be most effective. Out of the past freedom struggles, he does, however, offer us models and ways of thinking with which both implicitly critique our current values in politics and offer us a vision of hope for the future. In this way, Dr. Carson carries forward the best legacy of both the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King. Dr. Carson helps us to see King not as an icon, but as an individual who was criticized as well as praised by others in the movement and who came to consciousness and leadership as part of the complex history of black political struggles. Leadership for King was not preordained and was always contested. For as Ella Baker told us, Martin Luther King did not make the movement. The movement made Martin Luther King. In the three volumes of King's writings and letters Dr. Carson and his colleagues have published, we see the steps by which King evolved from a young man raised in the rich traditions of the black Southern church to a minister and a PhD in theology and a preeminent leader who not only articulated the values of grassroots people, but the highest values of American democracy. In this, our 30th year since the passing of Martin Luther King, the work of Dr. Carson and his colleagues to deepen our understanding of King's context and legacy is more important than ever in an era of increasingly global 
racial and ethnic division, sexism, homophobia, violence, poverty, and class injustice. My thanks to Clay Carson and to Susan Carson, who's with him here tonight, who's the managing editor of the Martin Luther King Papers, for coming to the University of Washington to present passages of Martin Luther King. We now have an opportunity to talk further with Dr. Carson about the King legacy. Please join with me in welcoming Claiborne Carson. Thank you, Michael. It's, it's really um, an honor to get an introduction from Michael because um, I've known him for a good while and really admired his work. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's really great to be here and uh, to give thanks to him also for being a good host. I'd, I'd also like to uh, thank Janet um, Jones, who has, uh, I think, earned her money this week. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if, if anyone... <laughs> She seemed to take everything in stride where, when I told her I didn't want to do a traditional lecture. I wanted to do a, a, uh, a dramatic reading and she said, okay, you know. <laughs> uh, sure, she had some doubts about it, but uh, uh, serving as uh, the producer of this play, I think, was um, beyond, beyond the call of duty. Um, I'd also like to... Um, to take the opportunity, I, I, it's not often that uh, that my wife Susan is is here, um, in uh, giving, listening to me give speeches. Uh, usually, she's just listening to me rant and rave around the office. But uh, I would like to uh, express an appreciation uh, for her work uh, for with the King Papers Project. Um, just just a few words uh, about. Uh, about her. Um, we've been together for 30 years, and uh, uh, that means that our relationship started back in the 60s, and I certainly wasn't a Stanford professor then. At that point, um, I was a draft dodger, and we were um, actually in exile. Um, we spent our, our honeymoon roaming around uh, Europe and North Africa and in flea bag hotels and um, youth hostels, and with the idea of perhaps never coming back, and somehow she thought that that was an exciting way to uh, to spend her life, and and wanted to uh, join in the adventure. And it has been an, uh, the 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 route from that place that we were 30 years ago to being a Stanford professor and a lecturer here at, at Washington is a remarkable journey. And I think it would take a book to tell how one got from one place to the other. But she's been there every step of the way, and I'd like to express appreciation. At least wave, Susan. <laughs> so. I, I know she's also very shy, so I didn't war forewarn her on this. But um, just a few words about, about the play. I, I'm really interested in getting your, uh, your feedback. I, I wanted to explain, first of all, what it is. Um, it, it's an adaption of a play that we produced uh, the Stanford Drama Department um, at uh, Stanford in 1993. And uh, it's quite different as a play. Uh, it, the, the focus of the play was the relationship between Martin Luther King and his father, Daddy King. As you notice, Daddy King is not even a character in this adaption we have here, because I decided for the purposes of, of, of this audience and this time uh, requirement uh, that we start in, in 1963, as opposed to going back to where Martin Luther King Sr. enters the picture, because he was there before there was a Martin Luther King Jr. And, and I think this is the, the, what gives his story particular weight, he was there after the assassination. So he was there before, he was there after, he was there in Ebenezer Baptist Church uh, before Martin, of course, was there. So the, the play has to do with that relationship of a son and a father who is also a social gospel preacher, um, that powerful presence of Daddy King, I think, pervades Martin Luther King's life. My own feeling is you can't understand Martin Luther King without understanding, I think, as he says in the reading, I was the son 
of a Baptist preacher, the grandson of a Baptist preacher, the great-grandson of a Baptist preacher. And I think that understanding that and what that meant to him growing up is a long way toward understanding uh, the uh, sources, the resources that Martin Luther King could fall back on. When he couldn't call on Daddy anymore, he could call on that God that Daddy told him about. So beyond that, I think that the play reflects a certain feeling about Martin Luther King's place in the movement. I don't think you can understand Martin Luther King in isolation. I think one of the objections I have to the way in which uh, King Day celebrations often take place is they focus on King as an individual. As Michael just said, King didn't make the movement. If it hadn't been for Rosa Parks, none of us would be here today. He didn't start the Montgomery bus boycott. He became the leader of a movement that was already 100% successful in keeping black people off the buses. So I think that what we need to do in terms of understanding him, and I hope that the, the reading goes a little ways in that direction, is to understand that these leaders that we hear about, the icons, King, Malcolm, usually di diametrically opposed to each other. You've got to choose one or the other. My attitude is, why not both? But in any case, it's not King or Malcolm as individuals. As I point out in the reading, both of them were deeply affected by this mass struggle of ordinary black folk who didn't wait for King or Malcolm to tell them to go into the streets. And create one of the great mass movements of human history. I think that is the true story. And somehow, if we can get across on the King holiday that the story is about ordinary people and how they created a movement that made possible the emergence of Martin Luther King, that made possible made it possible for Martin Luther King and many other people, myself included, to display our best qualities. One of the common elements of, of most of the people, and there's some I know in this room right now, who were participants in that movement is that when I interview them and ask them about, you know, what, what was that time in your life when you felt that you were working at your maximum? Bob Moses, a great leader in the struggle, uh, once compared what organizers do in the struggle to the power of nuclear energy. And what he meant by that was that the nuclear energy is taking a small amount of mass and releasing an enormous amount of energy. If you think about it, that's what the movement was. Learning how to do that, learning how to take a Fannie Lou Hamer in Mississippi, one individual with a third grade education, and understanding through the context of a movement all of the potential that was wrapped up in that person that would have never been expressed. She would have been, she would have worked on that plantation in Sunflower County, Mississippi for the rest of her life. And no one would have ever known that here is a woman who could shape the world. That, is, that to me, is what we have to get across on, on the King holiday, is that potential of a struggle to release the best qualities of all of us and particularly those who the existing social structure doesn't offer the opportunities to release their best qualities. A social movement is always most effective and most meaningful for those at the bottom because those are the people who are most transformed by the movement, by the opportunities opened up by the movement. 
That's why in the South, those kinds of people flock to the movement. And that's why many, if you go into some of those communities, they don't think the movement is over. No one told them. <laughs> They're still doing the same things. It might be that the country's changed and gone in a lot of different directions, but they are still struggling. So I think um, with that, I'd like to just kind of open it up for questions about whatever you want, and, um, and we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you.